Hey folks, we're going to continue our lecture series on forests of the southeastern coastal plain today. And we have um, the last lecture we talked about um, variations in evergreen forests, so longleaf pine, which is significantly different in historical um, and widespread forest type versus loblolly and slash pine, which are kind of more the forests that we more frequently see today and that have a lot of commercial importance. Today we're going to talk about the maritime forest, the cypress gum forest, Pocosins and Atlantic white cedar, and then bottomland hardwood forest, which will take us um, inland a little bit, and then we will pick up and talk about the Piedmont um, in the next lecture. So importantly, one of the things I want you to remember is that hydrology, microtopography, soils, and disturbance are kind of the major driving factors between forest and plant community types on the coastal plain. So in coastal plain forests, these are the factors that separate these forests that make them recognizable communities. So we're going to look at a lot of them. And for each of these forests, I'm going to start with a photo so that you can kind of get a sense of the forest since we're not visiting there today. The other thing I'll say is if the that you enjoy these forest type lectures, um, we're actually going to talk a lot more about them in the Forestry 261 course that I teach, which is um, Forest Communities. And that course I'm offering in Maymester, two-week Maymester class um, on the coastal plain and the uh, mountains. And then um, it's, a, it's a classic summer camp class. So for each of these forest types in lecture today, I'll show you a photo and then we'll talk about different components that make that forest what it is. So this photo is taken on the Elliott Coos Trail at Fort Macon, and you can see it's got a really gnarly kind of appearance. So um, importantly, the indicator species for maritime forest is live oak, which we will learn in lab. This is Quercus virginiana. And this is, you might look at that photo and think, oh gosh, that looks a whole lot like laurel oak or sand laurel oak, and you would be right. Um, it is very similar to those two species, so we'll learn the differences in lab. One of the differences you can see pretty evidently is the, um, the acorns, which are kind of long ovals, kind of bullet shaped, and they're small acorns, um, but a little bit larger than the ones for Laurifolia and Hemispherica. Looking at the live oak um, species distribution map, you can see that this is from the flora of North America. And you can see the bright green, light green counties are showing that maritime forest type driven by live oak. So Quercus virginiana is really a strictly coastal plain species. We do see it planted, however, um, it's, a, it's a popular species to plant and it is an evergreen oak species. So for each of our forest types, we're gonna talk about that structure of the forest. You know, what does it look like? What is it? Um, have in different layers. We'll talk about species composition, wildlife value, um, environmental factors, what are the factors that drive this forest, what is the disturbance regime, if there's a regular disturbance important for these types, and then also conservation and threats. So you can see forest structure, I tried to show that in a number of different slides, you can see I, that I, I sort of describe this as a gnarly forest. Maritime forest is the kind that often has live oak and um, Spanish moss. That's the epiphyte um, species that's hanging from these trees. It's actually not a moss. And then the understory can vary. And you can see maybe a little bit of a glimpse of sand um, in the understory of that species. So this is kind of the cross section of a barrier island. And so I'm wondering if you can see which direction we're looking on this barrier island, north or south. And then secondly, think about what the key environmental factors are that shape maritime forests. So if you're standing on a barrier island, right, you can imagine yourself maybe at Shackleford Banks or some other place on the coast um, or the Outer Banks looking north, right? So we have the ocean to the east and then the salt marsh on the back side of these barrier islands. And maritime forests tend to develop in the last dune line, behind the last dune line where they're most protected. So you'll sort of have a, you know, open beach community and then kind of the sand dunes with their resultant plant communities. And then as we build up a little bit of soil and a little bit of protection from salt spray, you'll get trees and shrubs that occur, sort of a maritime scrub, and then mature trees behind that, behind the biggest dune line um, where they're protected from salt spray. And then behind that, a gradation down to salt marsh. <clears throat> 
And so let's talk about some of these key environmental factors that make maritime forests the way they are. So you can see, um, right, disturbance is a really important component of maritime forests. And, you know, if you look at a map, a temperature and precipitation map for the southeastern coastal plain, you're not going to see a whole lot of variation. Um, so it's other factors that really drive why these forest types occur. So maritime forest, importantly, have sandy soils. So what does that make them prone to? Right, so sandy soils have, are prone to drought, right? So those species need to be, um, they're very well drained, so you don't have a lot of water sitting in the soil, and so they're drought prone, and the species that live there need to tolerate that. They also have to tolerate wind and storms, so that's a, that disturbance is a really important factor, as well as salt spray and overwash. You can see this picture from Fort Fisher showing some maritime forests, and notice how flat the canopy is up at the top. Um, you know, so that's, People wondered for years, scientists wondered whether that was winds that shaped those canopies. As it turns out, um, it's really salt spray is the factor. So this evergreen canopy forms a very thick um, canopy layer and that protects the trees and, this, and the other species underneath from salt spray. If you have forests, um, the trees grow little branches up into and out of that canopy. Um, they tend to be pruned off by salt spray. So Vegetation doesn't do well with um, being coated in salt. And you also notice some adaptations of each of those species for salt. So you can get a storm and overwash, right? So these species might sometimes be susceptible to, you know, inundation by salt water in a storm event. Not very frequent on the backside of these barrier islands, but certainly salt, salt spray and hurricanes and storms are a huge factor in shaping this maritime forest. And those species need to be adapted for that kind of disturbance. So looking at the canopy of these forests, so this, this photo is taken kind of inside of a maritime forest and you can see it's quite dark. Um, the canopy, as I said, is live oak, Quercus virginiana. Um, and so you also have significant components of loblolly pine which might surprise you a little bit, but, and then sand laurel oak, which we learned in lab, Quercus hemispherica, can tolerate those sandy soils. And then we have a pretty decent developed shrub layer. So looking at this photograph, you can see that there are canopy trees and it's a closed canopy, but there's also a significant shrub component. And that consists of species that we'll also learn in class, right? Yopan holly, Ilex vomitoria, Eastern red cedar, which is Juniperus virginiana, Var silicola. So silicola refers to silicone, right, which is sand. And then um, wax myrtle, which is Morella serifera, right, which we also learned in lab. So all of these, if you think about it, are evergreen species. They have a waxy coating that makes them, um, protects them from salt spray. You can see on this one, the understory layer is sparse. I wouldn't say it's absent. There's certainly some species on the ground there. Um, this species may be south of Bald Head Island, and I'm saying that because I can see a saw palmetto in the understory. And so knowing the distribution of that species helps me guess where I am. And there's, you know, usually vines and uh, plenty of poison ivy in these forests as well. So these forests do have a tremendous wildlife value, and they're extremely threatened. Um, there's very little maritime forest, mature maritime forest that's left. But you can see on this Juniperus virginiana var silicicola, um, a painted bunting, right? This photo is taken from Our State magazine. And the Wildlife Resources Commission has posted this table of the priority species associated with this maritime forest. And you can see there's quite a few um, state listed, rare, um, endangered, or special concern species. So that includes the painted bunting. Um, on the reptile side of things, eastern coral snake is an endangered species, federally endangered. Then we've got eastern king snake, um, some um, amphibians like oak toad and southern duskies and eastern spadefoot toads. So these forests are in tremendous conservation importance. They also happen to have a lot of habitat for um, some of the wading bird species. For example, this white ibis at Bald Head Island Conservancy. Um, and these forests are threatened, first of all, by development, right? So these barrier, these forests tend to occur in barrier island environments. Certainly in North Carolina, these are some of the most popular areas for people to go and develop. Um, and so huge amounts of this forest have just been lost to development. And then more recently, we have um, effects of climate change 
especially sea level rise, right? So these forests are somewhat resistant to salt spray, but they cannot tolerate inundation by salt water for long periods of time. So that um, this forest type is extremely threatened in North Carolina. There's very, very little mature maritime forest left. And so they're a significant conservation concern. So let's move on and talk about our next forest type. And you can see this one has a very recognizable structure. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. This forest is actually, even though this is a coastal plain forest type, this photo was taken in Wake County at the Robertson's Mill Pond. And so again, right, each of these forests, I want you to understand and know the forest structure, the species composition, environmental factors, disturbance, and threats. So this photo is taken in Craven County at the Cool Springs Environmental Center in outside of New Bern. So the Cypress Gum Swamp is this forest type, and we'll look at a couple of kinds. Again, when you get to, if you take the forest communities class um, that is part of the forestry summer camp, we'll learn lots of more, lots more different kinds and some gradations within them. So we'll learn these forests in a lot more detail, but for this purpose, we're just gonna group them into broader categories. So Cypress Gun Swamps, right, if you look at the forest structure, right, first let's talk about geography. Often they're adjacent to bottomland sites and rivers, and this is an area where um, this is the wettest part of the coastal plain. I think every photo I've showed you, um, this one looks a little funny, but that's actually, those trees are actually rooted in the water with a layer of duckweed um, that's causing, that makes it look like green astroturf, but that's actually um, duckweed that's floating on the water surface. Um, so this is the wettest of all the coastal plain types, right? So if we're going to group our communities on a moisture spectrum or a hydrologic spectrum, these are on the wettest parts. So often these forests are flooded for half the year. The forest consists of a canopy of flood tolerant species. And if you look at these forests, like look at the, um, this one's got a little bit more structure to it, but for the most part, there's not a whole lot in the understory. So there's nothing on the herbaceous layer because it's flooded. Um, and, you know, some of these forests might have some sprouts or shrubs, but for the most part, it is a, you know, closed forest canopy and very little in the understory and nothing in the herbaceous layer. So that makes them quite res recognizable. This one is a little bit drier. This is taken in the Hoffman Forest. This is our forest communities class from 2019. So when we think about cypress gum swamps, they vary a little bit in species, depending on whether you're in a black, brown water swamp or a black water swamp. Brown water swamps, and we're gonna talk about this more later in the lecture, brown water swamps are more widespread. They tend to occur along um, rivers that um, are fed from the Piedmont, where blackwater swamps originate in the coastal plain. So in brown water swamps, you're going to get species of Taxodium disticum, which we learned in lab, and also Nyssa flora, which we probably won't get to see this semester. But it's a species of tupelo or gum that is more adapted for moist environments. And then the blackwater swamps have Taxodium ascendens, which we also learned in lab, and Nyssa aquatica. So an even more water loving uh, tubelo. And then we have other species. So we learned Fraxinus carolineana. Red maple and black gum are both um, species that tolerate a wide range of conditions. So they are found in these cypress gum swamps as well. So just looking quickly at Nyssa biflora, this is swamp tubelo. So if you look at the photograph, it looks pretty familiar to our Nyssa sylvatica. Um, but this is Nyssa biflora, and it is um, found only in wetland habitats. And you can see from the map that it's mostly a coastal plain species, sometimes venturing up into the Piedmont, but found in the southeast, um, so South Atlantic, southeast, and Gulf states. And then looking at um, the distribution of Taxodium ascendens, right, which is restricted to blackwater swamps, versus Taxodium disticum, bald cypress which is a little bit more widespread. So interestingly, right, pond cypress is found in the black water systems. Black water systems originate in the coastal plains. So if you look at its distribution, you can see that pretty clearly, right? The bright green showing where um, Taxodium ascendance is found. And then Disticum is, is found a lot more along um, brown water rivers. So you can see it going, venturing up into and along the Mississippi River. 
Um, just a quick comparison here. This is review from lab, right? Taxodium ascendens has the oppressed all like foliage where um, Taxodium disticum is more spreading. So these cy cypress gum forests, right? So a big factor is hydrology. They're flooded all winter and most of early spring. Um, and again, they stay wet for sometimes up to half the year. And that's a major selective factor. There's very few species that can tolerate that kind of flooding. Sometimes they have special adaptations. You can see in this um, Taxodium ascendens photo from summer camp that they have um, buttresses, right? So the trees flare at the base and that can help with them stay rooted in these wet environments. And then you can also see they, this is a photo that includes some of the cypress knees and yeah, there's a lot of speculation about these being used for gas exchange, but no hard evidence about it. So it's really not, sh not known as to the function of those knees. Sometimes they have it, sometimes they do not. Um, when you're looking at disturbance, right, there's no cycle of natural disturbance. Fire is not an issue in these wet environments. Um, they can certainly be impacted by hurricanes. And, you know, these, when you're in a cypress gum forest or a cypress gum swamp, they often feel like they've been unchanged for millions of years. Um, and I have a photo here. This is one of the really giant bald cypress trees. These are the trees that are found on the Black River in North Carolina, which have been dated past 2000 years. So pretty amazing to think about being in these forests that have been unchanged through history. Um, these forests are threatened primarily by saltwater intrusion, and that's, that's probably more true for the Taxodium disticum, the, the brown water systems, right, where you've got saltwater intrusion and coming up river systems from the, that these forests are not tolerant to. So we'll talk about that more a little bit later. So here's an aerial, this, this um, these elliptical um, depressions run with a northwest southeast orientation. These are Carolina Bays and so we're going to talk a little bit about Carolina Bays um, and that includes Pocosins as well as Atlantic White Cedar and again forest communities will talk about all the different kinds that are within that but we're going to talk about them in broad terms today. So Probably if you've taken classes before where Pocosins were mentioned, it was um, defined as it's an Algonquin Native American word that means swamp on a hill. But my colleague um, who is Lumbee, Dr. Ryan Emanuel, actually looked up the linguistics for it and then I had to look up after he told me about it. It actually doesn't translate to swamp on a hill at all, so we're not really sure where that came from. But it is uh, originally an Algonquin term that's more generic. It refers to a wet area or a wetland. And when we're talking about this area, when I talk about Carolina Bays, really what we're talking about there is geography. And then the forest types of that are within that Carolina Bay geography include Pocosins and Atlantic White Cedar. So those are two of the community types that we'll talk about that are found usually um, associated with those Carolina Bays. Pocosins will also sort of grade in and talk a little bit about bay forests because that's a forest type that is kind of in the same family as Pocosins. So this aerial photograph, you can see some of the remaining um, Carolina bays, and you can see that some of them exist as lakes, like White Lake, which many of you may have visited, um, is a Carolina bay. But you can also see ones that are vegetated, right? So um, some of these are vegetated. You can see this one that's here that's been converted to agriculture, right? But you can still see the original bay shape. So conversion um, to agriculture and drainage of these bays has been a big impact. And so there's not nearly as many bays as there used to be. You can see them large and small still on these aerial th photographs throughout the landscape. Um, Jones Lake State Park is where we normally go during the semester for a day so that we can learn some of these coastal plain types. So pay that place a visit when you have a chance. So definition of Carolina bays, these are elliptical bays. Um, they either have open water or wetland forests and they have that north, northwest southeastern orientation. And significantly soil is a big um, factor here for these types of forests. So forest types that we find here need and require organic soils. So that's 
a definition of Carolina Bay that they have organic soils. Typically they have organic soils on most of the bay and then there's a sandy rim on the southeastern um, rim of those Carolina Bays. And I just talked about the, how many have been drained and converted to agriculture. We could see that on the aerial photograph. We're not entirely sure about the origin and formation of Carolina Bays, although we have a lot more ideas um, than we used to. But one I want to dispel is this idea that this was a meteor shower and meteors hit the earth and sort of dug out these Carolina Bays. Okay, that, that hypothesis has been debunked. There's no meteor fragments there. There's no evidence that links it. It's kind of a romantic notion, um, but one that you should forget about because it's not true. Instead, um, the more mundane explanation is that these bays formed through long-term wind and weather patterns. So over time, steady winds kind of pushed the soil up to one side and dug them out. But all of these types of Carolina Bay forests have seasonally wet organic soils. That's a major environmental factor. And we think with the difference among these different types is disturbance. So, um, and disturbance in this case is talking about fire. So Pocosins and Bay forests and associated communities, they think have a moderate fire regime. And so this is not our longleaf pine fire cycle of one to three years. This is a 10 year cycle. And then we have an Atlantic white cedar forest and we're gonna talk about each of these separately. We think these forests are dependent on in, infrequent but totally catastrophic fire that completely destroys the canopy. So here we're talking about greater than a 50 year interval between fires. Um, so first we're gonna talk about Pocosin or Bay forests. And they, like I said, they have organic soils ranging from a few feet deep to 12 feet deep of muck. Um, this muck also, um, right, if you can imagine the Carolina Bays and depression ponds, they fill with these leaves, which don't break down because there's no access to oxygen. And so they turn into eventually this organic muck soil, which tend to hold water like a sponge. So even though on the landscape, they're slightly elevated, um, they're extremely wet and they have these deep, um, sometimes very deep organic soils. You can tell um, this photo from summer camp in 2019 uh, shows the inevitability of you know, driving around the Hoffman Forest on a wet day, you're going to get your vehicle stuck. One of, the, one of the vehicles is going to get stuck. And so these organic soils are extremely slick. It is very, very easy to get stuck in these kinds of soils. Just part of the summer camp experience. So um, looking at the forest structure, this can really vary. So often there's an open canopy. This photo was taken in 2020 of, uh, you can see John Sanders, who's the Hoffman Forest Manager and then two of our forest management seniors standing in um, what probably would be called low Pocosin. Sometimes we call these evergreen shrub bogs um, as a general category. So the areas where they're standing, there's not even a tree canopy at all. It's just a big thicket of evergreen vegetation. Um, some of the drier sites or ones that haven't been disturbed will have trees and you can see trees behind them they can be develop and turn into bay forest. So we're not sure if that's a disturbance factor or if it has something to do with hydrology, probably it's a factor of each. And so you can see what we're standing in here is this very thick evergreen mid-story, right? So evergreen shrubs, and there are loads of them, um, or understory of bay species. And a lot of these species are in the Ericaceae family or the Heath family. And there are these evergreen waxy shrubs. Often these places are woven together with vines like Smilax that are thorny. So, um, and you know, underneath these shrubs, it's so thick in there, there's very little in the herbaceous layer. You can see a few ferns at the bottom. Some of the ferns that are wet tolerant um, can make a living kind of at the edges of these shrub bogs. So in this case, right, the forest, there's really, you wouldn't really call it a forest, it's more of a woodland or a, a shrub bog. Um, but in other areas of the forest, this photo on the left is looking at bay forest with some of the bay species. Unfortunately, we won't get to see these. Normally we would see them at Jones Lake. If you have canopy species that can be pond pine, which is Pinus serotina, so this is a fire adapted species, adapted in a different way than longleaf. Um, 
adapted to ca catastrophic fires, right? Where fire is on a long interval, right? Remember 10 years, right? But the, um, it completely destroys the canopy. And so the adaptations are to regenerate following fire. And then the understory shrub layer you can see is quite developed. So um, at least in this particular bay forest, when we talk about bay species, they all have common names that include bay. Okay, so you know sweet bay magnolia, right? We've learned that one already. But then there's species called swamp bay and loblolly bay. So you can see they're all in different genera. Um, we also have tai tai, which is Cyrilla raciflora. If you ever go to Leates Mill Pond, it's actually growing on the lake edge there. Sweet Bay Magnolia, Magnolia virginiana, Swamp Bay, which is Persea perlustris, and Loblolly Bay, which is Gordonia lazianthus. So those are the kind of the species composition. Um, there's not a whole lot in the understory of even these bay forests, but they are all woven together with vines. So it can be quite a tangle to negotiate if you're not on a trail. Um, like I said, disturbance, we're looking at what we think is about a 10 year fire cycle. And like I said, pond pine is fire adapted. So the cones are serotonous. They only open in the heat of a fire. They also have a feature of epicormic branching. So if the, if the canopy gets killed, they can re-sprout from the trunk. And then their um, bark is thicker than you would expect for their size, um, which helps them withstand some fire. And some of the threats to Pocosins or Bay Forest, because these are also forests that can kind of sit without much change for many, many years. Um, before these were considered wetlands and before wetlands were protected under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, um, a lot of these forest types were ditched and drained. So they would convert these, they would harvest any timber that was there, ditch them and drain them so that they could be converted to agriculture. These forests can be very tr tricky to manage um, and forest management. Um, and nowadays, the real threats to these things are fire suppression and climate change. So one um, tricky thing about fire in a Pocosin or Bay forest, anywhere where you have organic soil, is that you can end up getting um, the soil can burn. And once the soil starts, it's a deep peat soil. Remember, they can continue to burn for months at a time. And since I've been in North Carolina, we've have had some organic soil um, Pocosin fires. The Hoffman Forest had one in 2019, and this, that's what this photo on the left is showing. So this is um, actually loblolly pine that was growing in organic soil. And what was so crazy to see in this Pocosin fire um, that was burning the organic soil is that the trees were kind of collapsing because the soil was burning out from underneath them. It was a low enough fire that the fire wasn't getting into the canopy, but it was killing the tree nonetheless because it was burning up all the soil underneath it. So these trees were ending up sitting in these pits where the soil had burned away. And you can see some of the brown foliage, right? So that affects those root systems and those trees were um, dying. So for forest managers, one of the things they were trying to do was salvage log it. So try to get some value out of that timber before it just died um, from having the soil and root systems burned. So pretty interesting. Um, climate change can also affect these forests, um, especially when you're talking about rainfall patterns. Um, so just a, so we're gonna stay in the organic soil. So we're still looking at organic soil, coastal plain forests. And moving on to talk about Atlantic white cedar. So this is a canopy shot taken at Jens Lake State Park of some pretty magnificent large trees. So the forest structure for Atlantic white cedar is a little bit different from bay forests and Pocosin forests. Although there's some speculation that if a forest that's a bay forest isn't burned, eventually Atlantic white cedar will come in. So Atlantic white cedar has historic value. It used to exist as these beautiful, pure, even age stands that were very old. Um, there are very few remaining stands that are like that. There are some, probably the greatest number are found in the Albemarle Pamlico Peninsula, um, kind of up towards northeastern part of the state. And for the most part, these forests tend to have an even age structure. So when you have forests that are all about the same age, it suggests that sometime in the past there was some kind of catastrophic disturbance and that probably that's what's needed for regeneration. So they're thinking that this 
catastrophic disturbance came in the form of fire. And it's speculated that the fire cycle is greater than 50 years. So fire that's not very often, but it's something that's going to burn up the entire stand in order to regenerate. Um, and so this, you know, when you have a lot of, if you look at that picture on the right, that's not especially old forest, but you can see there is a lot of organic material there. So that can result in a really hot fire, could burn into the soil and completely clear the seedbed, and that could open up the way for Atlantic white cedars to start. Um, in the past, these forests were still exclusively logged. Atlantic white cedar is an incredibly important species, or was. Um, but unfortunately, it's mostly been cleared out through selective cutting. And so selective cutting means you go in and you take your best trees. And so those forests have mostly converted to um, water tolerant gums and also red maple. So very low value for timber. Um, so looking at species composition, right, the main species here is Camisiparis dioides. Um, that photo of me is taken at Jones Lake State Park. And you can see in the photo on the left, you know, the pointed canopies of Atlantic white cedar. So they are a conical species right on the coast with this, you know, shreddy whitish bark. So I'm sure you can guess that this is in the Cupressaceae family. And the species distribution, you can see this is a species that, you know, maybe is found coastal systems farther north. But in North Carolina, um, you know, it's a lot less widespread than some of other, our other species. So, um, and so I want to pause just a minute to talk about fire as some kind of a selective mechanism in the southeastern coastal plain. So you can have different forest types depending on what fire frequency you have. So the last lecture we talked about longleaf pine needing frequent low intensity fires, right? And in that case, the adaptations those species have are to survive fires, right? So in longleaf, longleaf specifically, right, they have seed germination during the fall, which is when we don't have fires. There's that grass stage that they can stay in for a long time. Um, and the foliage, which is, right, is a foot long or more, protects those buds so it can survive a low level frequent fire. Um, the trees do tend to prune their dead branches off. So there's no ladder for fire to climb into the canopy and the mature trees have very thick bark. So this is a species that's adapted to have fire on a one to three year interval, you know, very low level because there's not lots, there's not a lot of fuel um, and stays on the ground. And basically the function of that is for it to survive and then um, survive the low level fire because it's a poor competitor. When you're talking about Atlantic white cedar, this is talking about an infrequent high intensity stand regenerating fire, right? So the main adaptation per se is that the plants can regenerate after the fire. So, um, and pond pine can fall into this. When we're talking about serotonous cones, we're talking about pond pine. Um, so cones that are held together with resin until the heat of a fire opens them up. And think about what a clever adaptation that is. So the seeds will only release when the habitat conditions are perfect re for regeneration. So this is a, these are shade intolerant species. And so it needs a clean seed bed and open sunlight to regenerate. Um, these species tend to produce cones early. They're precocious, right? So they can take advantage of any particular fire that comes along. They have short needles and they do tend to retain dead branches. So that'll pull a fire up into the canopy. And again, these species are not, they have thin bark. They're not really adapted to survive fire as, as much as regenerate after a fire. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit more. And this is our last community type we'll talk about in this lecture. So these are bottomland hardwood forests. And this is gonna take us from the coastal plain up into the Piedmont, because we have bottomland forest types here in the Piedmont. And you can see this is a beautiful, diverse structure, right? So you can see there's canopy trees, there's mid-story and there's understory. So, um, and I'm, like I said, I always try and show several landscape photos so you can get a sense of the variety in these forest types. So looking at the forest structure, species composition, environmental factors, disturbance and threats. And you can see this particular forest, this is a wintertime photo. So it's hard to see if there's much in the herbaceous layer, there might be during the growing season. Um, but you can see they are also pretty wet. 
So looking at North Carolina, bottomland hardwood forests can occur throughout the state. They're associated with river basins and specifically small creeks um, that go along with those river basins. Um, just to revisit quickly again, the brown water versus black water sites, the White Oak River Basin, this is an example of black water system, right? Because it, the river originates in the coastal plain. Whereas the Noose River Basin, we know originates here in Raleigh at Falls Lake. And um, that's considered a brown water system. So forest structure. So where are you gonna find these forests? So if I'm trying to find bottomland hardwood forest because I'm studying a certain species of wildlife that needs it, I'm gonna look for them next to brown or black water rivers that have periodic flooding. So much drier than our cypress gum swamps, um, drier than Pocosins or Atlantic white cedar forests, but definitely adapted to a periodic flood. They usually have closed canopies and they can have very large and old trees. The understory it varies, right? So you've already seen from the couple pictures I've shared so far that there's some understory or midstory species um, over time, these become uneven aged. They can have shrubs. And then the herb layer is also variable. So some are pretty diverse. If it's really wet, probably won't have a lot in the herb layer. So again, right, brown water rivers are sometimes called red water rivers. They or originate in the Piedmont or mountains. And importantly, they carry sediment down to the coastal plain. And then on the flip side of that, we have black water rivers. They originate in the coastal plain. They tend to be clear, but they're very, very high in tannins. So if you look at a black water river, it's obvious as to where it gets that name. The water is clear, but very, very dark and acidic. So question for you, which type of for it, which type do you think has a higher diversity of species? Brown water river or black water river? Okay, so if you grasp Blackwater River, um, you would be wrong, right? Brownwater rivers have greater diversity of species. So why might that be? So Blackwater River is, again, highly acidic water. So that takes a special suite of species that can tolerate that. And then they lack sediment. So it's not so much sediment, but nutrients that get into these rivers. So if you look at any kind of forest community in a Blackwater system is gonna be less diverse than forest communities that are in the brown water systems. So the brown water systems are carrying sediment, but that sediment contains nutrients. Um, and so the, it, there's a greater variety of species. Um, and if you go to Swift Creek Bluffs, right, you'll see that there's a huge diversity of species, woody plant species there. Black water, less so. There's less diversity, um, less nutrients, and species have to be able to tolerate those acidic conditions. Um, some other factors to consider, right? So these are necessarily wet and low lying. And um, because they're wet, fire is not, not really a factor. So it's not part of the disturbance there. Um, and these bottomland hardwood forests provide very important habitat. You could see with the diverse structure, there's lots of different niches that species can use. So the photo on the top right is a prothonotary warbler of these uh, warblers love to build nests in these bottomland hardwood sites. So they're ones, they're not too shy, so there's, there are birds that you can easily see if you visited a bottomland hardwood forest, especially in the kind of late spring area when they're nesting. Disturbance-wise, right, so bottomland hardwoods had some extremely valuable timber, so they were logged extensively. Um, one limitation to logging, of course, is that it's wet enough that you have to plan carefully so you don't damage the soil. And then of course these um, systems are prone and vulnerable to hurricanes. So Congaree Swamp National Forest in Columbia, South Carolina lost a ton of their champion trees during Hurricane Hugo, which was in 1989, right? These big trees and the root systems can be fairly shallow because they're in these wet areas. So looking at species composition, it's slightly different depending on whether you're in a brown water or black water river system. So Brown water rivers, as we said, are higher diversity because of the nutrient rich sediment that's being carried down. And these are oak dominated forests. So Quercus pagoda, Quercus mishoei, and Quercus laurifolia are our three oaks that are most common on these brown water bottomland hardwood systems. But we can also see, um, we've certainly seen many examples of green ash. Um, 
Praxinus pensylvanica, liquid amber, styracifulus, sweet gum, Ulmus americana, right? American elm and Carpinus caroliniana. And the, the black water systems are a little bit different. So they tend to have Quercus laurifolia, right? So Quercus laurifolia is common in both black water and brown water bottomland hardwood forests. And also maybe surprisingly Pinus tata can actually tolerate a fair bit of flooding. And then the understory in Blackwater Rivers, Mangalia virginiana, um, some of the bay species, Parsia perlustris, and Cyrilla racemiflora, which is tai tai. So in looking at the two photos, you can see that the trees often have kind of a buttressed base, which gives them a little bit of stability. And then you can see in the lower photo that there's quite a, you know, pretty good herbaceous layer, less developed in the top photo. So threats to bottomland systems, right, har being harvested and converted to agriculture is what's impacted them mainly in the past. Um, so we don't have a lot of examples of really beautiful, intact bottomland hardwood forests. And then certainly development is a factor in these areas. We also have threats coming from invasive species. So bottomland hardwood forests that have a significant component of ash are threatened by the emerald ash borer. Um, and this is a species that's really traveling quickly throughout the state and just killing huge swaths of green ash. You can see some of that damage if you go in the Piedmont, if you go to the Walnut Creek Wetland Center, which is pretty close to campus, their canopy is green ash and it is all completely dead from emerald ash borer. So um, just a quick wrap up. So one thing I wanna mention, I think, in every slide I talked about how climate change does threaten all coastal plain forests. And so that can be in a number of different ways. First, we might see large scale changes in our precipitation patterns um, with climate change, but also sea level rise is a big concern. I linked an, an article in a 10 minute video here from Science Friday, really urge you to watch it if you get the chance, um, because it's really graphic and shows the change within 10 years of some of the forests on the coastal plain, right, that are being inundated with salt water, which kills the trees and leaves these really ghostly um, stems remaining. Um, colleagues of mine, Dr. Marcelo Ardone and Dr. Ryan Emanuel, have been working on ghost forests in the Albemarle Pemlico um, Peninsula for over 10 years now, and the change is really evident. And then finally, just to wrap up, this is all of the forest types in the southeastern coastal plain that are developed into these, you know, we've divided them into pretty broad categories, right? Looking at longleaf, loblolly, and slash pine forests, maritime forests, cypress gum swamps or cypress gum forests, Carolina bays, which can either have Pocosin or bay forests or Atlantic white cedar. And then finally, bottomland hardwood forests. And that's a wrap. <laughs>